James, welcome to AVNF Inside Europe podcast. Hello, thank you. Thanks a lot for joining us. Obviously, it was fantastic to meet you in person just a couple of days ago uh, when I was back in London and we met together with the whole team of Simple Flying. So fantastic to meet you all guys. Now we have to have a uh, ability to talk to each other again on on Zoom, uh, which is good as well. So let's start with the with the usual question: What is your background? What is your what does your aviation journey look like? I, I would suggest it's kind of strange for me, pretty unusual. Um, I've always been interested in aviation since I was a little boy, really, thanks to my dad, um, and this followed into university, BSc and MSc in air transport management. And for my sins, I decided to do a PhD in airline strategy focused on network airlines in Asia and how they can try to compete more effectively with low-cost carriers. I followed this through with about five years of teaching at university level, airline economics and airline strategy in particular. And then after that, I decided to enter the industry finally after quite a few years. I worked at Luton Airport in route development, trying to, I'm getting all that data for new proposals to um, achieve new routes, new passengers, new airlines. Um, after that, I worked as chief analyst for Anada Aero. Sadly, the pandemic has pretty much meant that ceases to has ceased to exist now, unfortunately, but it's a very, very good business to business publication. And now I write on route, route uh, articles, route stories for Simple Flight. Yeah, actually, that's how we met last week. And um, it's great that you can still be uh, doing what you love, which I guess is, is a root development and we will get to that uh, in, a, in a moment. So when did you start to work for Simple Flying and how, how do you find this working in a basically virtual team with, with all your colleagues all around the world? Well, it's, it's really good. It's very, very different. I'm, I've worked from home probably for the last two years, I guess. So roughly seven months of that with simple flying. And the great thing is nowadays, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, so long as you do your job and you're accessible, then that's all that really matters. You're trusted to get on with it, which I think is very important. Um, yeah, so it's about seven months of simple flying. I write typically about three stories a day on route related or airline related or fleet related stories and different developments. And I also just create a brand new news routes letter, newsletter that um, really showcases in a celebratory kind of way, new routes being launched and also route launches, kind of similar to Anadair on an enormous scale with massive uptake already, which is very impressive to see. I think it's kind of testament to the fact that people want good news stories rather than just that the recovery is going on and kind of tedious but important things. Absolutely. And I definitely recommend everyone to subscribe to this newsletter. You can do that quite easily on simpleflying.com. I am subscribed and I received your fresh newsletter. Uh, I think it was yesterday. Yesterday, the, the, Tuesday, two o'clock. Yeah. Yep. Uh, the, the freshest version. So as you are saying, great to always great to hear some positive news. So uh, one more question about back about your, your journey. So uh, you, can you say which part was the most enjoyable for you? Oh, every, I Was like always, I'm always very enthusiastic, so I like everything that I do. Um, well, very quickly, I guess, in terms of teaching, I absolutely love being in front of 50, 100 people, um, where you're doing something that challenges people, you know, and then I can see from your smile that you'd probably be quite good at this. Um, <laughs> and then they challenge you, they say, hang on, this does this actually make sense? What if we actually change this? You know, that's, that's really, really exciting, very invigorating. Um, Hopefully they get something out of it too. Fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. um, I always love data. That's my background, ultimately, but not just random things, but things that actually make sense in particular. Um, numbers on, on, on unserved markets and how they can be grown and grown through low cost carriers and so on. And also network carrier connectivity and, you know, you had a route, therefore this happens. It is really, it's pretty fun, and I like that, even, even as a hobby, which seems kind of unusual, I guess, but it's the case looking into these things. And I really enjoy interviewing people. I haven't done it very much in the last year or so, but in previous jobs, I've been all around the world interviewing lots of people, and you can just ask them very informally, ask them lots of different questions. And A, you, a your knowledge increases, your understanding increases, but so you can pass it on to others. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, 
Right. So let's get into it. Root development. What makes root development so special for you? Um, I guess it goes back to my dad. He died in the last year or so. So I'll always be grateful to him for getting me into aviation. But very unusually, he used to bring back not toys or anything or sweets or anything. He used to bring back those math, massive OAG books, like um, big um, telephone guides from travel agencies. I'm not entirely sure why. Um, <laughs> And I would just flick on the floor, going through and going through and looking at all the different routes all over the world, hundreds of pages, massive things. Of course, it's all online nowadays, but that has ultimately that got me into aviation, that and trips to the airport, and in particular into route development. Um, ultimately, we have to think that routes are the heart of an airline. Everything impacts routes and everything exists ultimately because of routes. And you could even say that brand new airlines start up because of unserved routes or overpriced routes or inadequately served routes or whatever. Think about Breeze in the USA, I suppose recently, um, you know, 80, 90% of their routes are brand new. There are hundreds of those in the USA that makes sense. And it's just ultimately the result of, or, you know, the route network will ultimately impact everything else and ultimately your success or failure. So that's probably why it goes to the heart of everything. Um, I guess also it's always changing you know, nothing is ever still. Um, Logan Air in the last year or so said 30% of their routes they expect to fail. So that you always have route churn. So looking into why things are working, why are not things are working, why aren't things working, that's very, very interesting and exciting. And I did that to a certain degree at Luton Airport in terms of Wizz Air and Ryanair and Wizz Air and um, EasyJet network and what routes are performing, how can you change that, more marketing, for example. Um, so those are the kind of reasons, lots of different small bits put together. Yeah, I have to admit, I share that passion with you as well during my time at the Košice Airport here in Slovakia. Uh, I did many things, including marketing, PR and uh, many other stuff. But the route development was was something that I loved the most, especially when you, we, we are lucky that I, I experienced a couple of those um, first flights, um, celebrations with all the water arcs and all that stuff. And it's just amazing feeling when you see people entering the aircraft, walking uh, towards it, and you know that you made it happen happen partly of course there is always wider team involved but you made it happen that this specific route is connecting families businesses getting Absolutely. tourism working it's just just fantastic no i 100 agree but at the same time it kind of surprises me that you don't get as many new route launch celebrations as you might expect you know at the moment if we assume there are maybe 20 30 routes a week maybe that are being launched brand new ones um you know you might only get 10 of those actually having any form of celebration so it's almost a missed opportunity. It's very easy to do, very cheap. Good. Absolutely. You know, the team, whoever's working on it, including the ground team, of course, they get a good feeling from it, easy on social media, and it costs a few hundred dollars or less. Exactly, 100%. Um, yeah, so we're slowly getting into, as, as you mentioned, what's, what's happening now. Uh, from a certain perspective, it may be like a golden era for route development because we see so many new routes opening, like airlines jumping on some opportunity opportunities so quickly that we haven't seen that in the past how, how do you understand that well i think you're right um normally of course in normal times you'd have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of new routes each year thousands really um obviously a good proportion won't or will obviously be cut at the same time so the net impact isn't so impressive but still huge numbers um you, you, what you just said is completely correct you know and especially in terms of network carriers, I think they're possibly more interesting at the moment. Um, so in Australia, for example, despite all the state closures, you have very, very obvious markets, big markets that haven't had any passing, any nonstop service, sorry, for the last couple of decades or more. Now attracting Virgin, Australia and Qantas, you know, um, for example, Adelaide to um, Norn Seston recently, a market of about 30,000 people. Normally in Europe, that have two daily flights with hmm. Ryanair or Wizz Air probably. Um, and also to Townsville and places like this, big, big markets, but they've always funneled them through their hubs in Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane. So in terms of that perspective, yeah, you're seeing loads more new opportunities from airlines where this isn't really their core. They're used to funneling people through. That's their business, which kind of makes me wonder, will they just cut these as soon as things pick up, then the normal markets pick up and ultimately redeploy assets? 
And if they do, of course, hopefully someone very nimble can come in and uh, operate them because they'd be ready-made markets. Um, in the USA also, American from, they've launched dozens and dozens and dozens of new routes from Austin and places like Nashville, very leisure heavy places, of course, but again, not core markets for them. So what's gonna happen? And in, of course, Wizz Air is taking, is, is really taking the lead with Ryanair and Turkish in Europe in terms of the recovery. And it's unbelievable how many routes Wizz Air have launched in the last year. It's just amazing. They've completely refocused towards Western Europe. You could argue it's possibly not performing enormously well. Hence, you know, the, the collapse of, of their um, um, Oslo and Trondheim. In Norway, places. yep. You know, so you kind of have to wonder how much market research they do, because you probably should know these challenges before you invest loads of time, money and resources in a particular country, because it's kind of straight, that was kind of straightforward mistake. Um, but equally, it'd be interesting with Ryanair, because they have three new um, intra-Sweden routes coming up from their new Stockholm, Arlanda Bay. So are they going to face a similar issue or are they going to be clever that's on the back of norwegian cutting those routes so it's been very, very and at, at the same time eurowings announcing some expansion in out of sweden so ryanair never misses an opportunity to compete no no um, to be fair though ryanair was first all oh, right then, then um ryanair was first then fin uh, finnair decided to launch asia and usa markets yep. from Orlando, then eurowings so can you imagine how good Orlando's new incentive scheme is <laughs> pretty impressive isn't it yeah i'm sure i'm sure i mean i think we can debate all day about all this um, uh, news happening uh, all the time especially here in europe which is the continent i follow the most mm -hmm. um but from let's let's take a step back and maybe have a, have a look take a look on the on the bigger picture in from the strategic point of view how do you see the whole let's say business of route development changing now when we are slowly getting out of the pandemic okay that's a very good question um i think oh, that's i think one lesson that everyone has probably hopefully learned or seen is how adaptive they can be it, possibly more in a negative way at the moment you know putting capacity in the market is changing the demand isn't there quickly redeploy it so maybe that is a good lesson for going forward being more adaptive more responsive to changes um that might impact planning of course but that, i like that idea of being more adaptive um i do think airlines are going to go more back to their core again like we were just saying um because it's very unusual territory for them opportunistic but then as they move on then i think they'll revert back in terms of Lots and lots and lots of airlines have withdrawn less fuel efficient aircraft, maintenance heavy aircraft, older aircraft, even if the ownership costs are pretty low. They've got rid of them. So they're going to have a much more stable and fuel efficient and more cost effective and economic platform going forward, which is exactly how you want to be after the pandemic subsides and as things really start getting back to back to normal so that's a very smart move they've cut workforces as hard as it is to say they've cut it um change terms conditions pay so fingers crossed their competitive profile if you like will be stronger which will hopefully feed in nicely to better route performance um, down the line i think lots of airlines will be after better deals with airports which is kind of an interesting balance the airline airport balance is always very very interesting but if the airport has very few passengers and the airline has very few passengers. You know, who's going to blink first in that in that game of chess, if you like, to drive more volume again? Because I think it will come down to price more than ever before, ultimately. So I think lots and lots of different things in terms of route development tools. So I remember maybe it's September now, maybe, maybe a year and a half ago, everyone was saying, well, historic data, you know, OAG type data or Sabre data for in 2019, you know, X passengers flew from here to here. Yeah, That's all dead. That's not usable anymore. That's clearly not correct because it's still enormously usable. You can't use 2020 data. That's meaningless. So you have to use the next best as an indication. But I think going forward, maybe we might see more acceptance of kind of of the moment data like Skyscanner data, you know, which is all based on search data. Um, there's a bit of an issue with uptake of that with some airports, I think. So if you can combine that, you know, someone sitting in their room times everyone and it, 
you know, 750,000 people are searching for this particular route, combine that with historic data for a more holistic picture. I think that would be the way forward, where you're not just relying on one data source. Yeah, I think that's something very inspiring that maybe some of the airport managers, uh, route development managers listening can can include in their presentations and in their uh, projects. Um, do you feel the same that the whole route development has like um, has been very very short term now recently? So, so usually it's, it's I mean it varies. It can take from three months to. 10 years to, to get a route uh, mm -hmm. from, from the airport perspective. I can certainly confirm that. Um, now airlines are making decisions in a much, much shorter term. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, 100% right. Yeah, absolutely. They're, again, they're being much more responsive and adaptive to what's happening around them, which logically, if they can do that against uh, planning constraints, then of course, that's a very good idea. What will be very interesting to see, though, is can they actually follow through with that as things begin to get properly back to normal, as loads properly increase, fares get back to similar levels, will they still be like that? Or will they just go back to what they did before? Exactly, that's the question. So let's, let's also uh, conclude our, our today's discussion. How do you see route development in two, three years when we are hopefully out of, out of this terrible pandemic? Will we ever get back to, to route development as, as we know it from the good old days? <laughs> well, I think um, I'm always an optimist, so I'm pretty much 100% sure everything is going to go back more or less to how it was before. Even the bad things will probably start to creep back in again. <laughs> But I'm, I'm very confident about that. I really think business demand will increase enormously. I mean, 10 years ago, when people were talking about video conferencing and things, You know, they said the death of business travel, but it didn't happen, of course, only tiny bits. And this will be the, almost inevitably the same with the situation at the moment. Um, I think lots of companies, lots of governments, bodies aren't really pulling their finger out enough. Things need to be much more um, happening and open and less restrictive, less bureaucratic. That's going to enormously impact the recovery. Um, you know, you need to get confidence up. I'm, I used to fly dozens and dozens of times each year, but I'm kind of not looking forward to flying, believe it or not, because of all the different endless documents, it's a big hassle. And if, if I don't want to do that very much, then the ordinary person who has no interest in flying possibly wouldn't either. So we need to get rid of all of that as quickly as we possibly can. Massive campaigns, probably very good prices, and really go for it because we have to do that to get back to normality. 100%. James, it was fascinating talking to you. Thanks a lot for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, before we say goodbye, uh, my favorite question, which I always ask at the very end, what do you love the most about aviation? Oh, I love everything, but ultimately the smell. Going into, I dropped off a friend um, on Sunday and ultimately as soon as you get out of the, out of the car, you can just smell the kerosene. And then that kind of like fresh grass almost <laughs> that kind of gets into your blood and sticks with you. Fantastic. Again, thanks a lot, James. Great talking to you. Take care. Thank you very much. And you. Beyond the horizon, above the clouds, the future of aviation shines bright. Take your seat, fasten your seatbelt and join us on a flight like no other. Meet and greet aviation's movers and shakers hear from leading airline CEOs, discover new products and technologies. Join the debate, network, connect, win. Get your free boarding pass today at futureflyingforum.com.